the introduction. I guess, is that too loud or just right? Just right, okay, thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to talk about dark matter and neutrino interactions. I think it's a little too loud, I'm gonna lower it. Okay, so the, my colloquium is gonna be very broad and it's gonna have a lot of aspects that uh, really it should have been like three or four colloquia um, uh, given by the different people that we work as a group. Um, so I'm gonna ask the big question. It's easy to ask the big question, right? Whether you have the answer or not. What is, it, it's an exciting time to be doing physics. Why? Because even after so many years of uh, physics research, uh, less than 5% of the universe is known. So that's very exciting, right? There's a lot of things that you can search and find. And uh, you know, the thing that I'm gonna focus on is a dark energy, a dark matter, 27%. I just changed my field, by the way. <laughs> so the dark energy, we have no idea, but there are astronomers trying to find out what dark energy is. It's a very exciting time. And you have heard Higgs has been discovered for a while, and then the, the LHC2 has started running with higher energy. So what kind of physics should be on, should be on that? And then also the neutrinos, they are mysterious. They are really the first particles that we believe or the first evidence of physics beyond the Fermi model. Because, you know, why is it small masses? What is the hierarchy? Is one of them much heavier than the other one or much lighter? Is there a fourth generation neutrino? Is it its own antiparticle? There are a lot of mysterious questions. And the key, that the, the take home message I want to tell you is our group here has developed technology and infrastructure and expertise that can actually address many of these questions uh, that is complementary to our belief in, in the large Hadron Collider. Okay, so I'll start with the dark matter problem. A, if you take, if we team physics, planets, the velocity of planets uh, from the sun, if you plot the velocity, you can explain with Newtonian gravity. Look at larger scales, stars, um, big galaxies, there's a big uh, velocity problem. They are moving much faster than they should, meaning there's a huge mass, missing mass, that you can't see that's making stars spin much faster. Okay, this, this has been known for 80 years. In our scale, it's almost like in a, you know, a prehistoric in some sense. So, and uh, yes, I mean, it's, it's universal. It's not like one galaxy that has this problem. A lot of those things, okay? So there is dark matter. We know dark matter exists. The cosmology in the last decade or so has become very precise. So it's sort of there's a standard model now based on many, many measurements thanks to our astronomers. Uh, this velocity problem that tells you there must be dark matter, cosmic microwave background, uh, the lensing, gravitational lensing experiment. So you can see how a background galaxy is, is lensed by a foreground object that tells you how much mass there is. And then you can create this image that tells you how much mass there should be. And when you compare with the physical mass, it doesn't add up. There's a lot of missing mass. And people used to think it's Newtonian gravity or Einstein's gravity that makes things change. But then came along the bullet cluster where two clusters or galaxies have gone through each other. And in X-ray, you see this ordinary matter that emits X-ray. They're very well separated from what you see from lensing, which is central to most of the matter. So which means the dark matter and ordinary matter, they got separated as the two galaxies went through each other. Very strong evidence that it is not a modified gravity. But then the question is, what is it? What is it made of? Can we detect it? Can we say something about it? That's where this amazing, I, I find this amazing, uh, the time we live in for the astronomy. I mean, you know, the astronomers are looking out to bigger and bigger distances, the things that they're finding, the missing mass. It's actually, as particle physicists, we're looking smaller and smaller objects, and we get stuck. We can't explain some of the particle physics processes without bringing in physics beyond the Fermi model. The amazing thing is they are probably related. And that's what, probably dark matter is. It probably got created after Big Bang. There was, there was internal radiation uh, in equilibrium with radiation. Then things happened. It decayed, it, uh, not decayed, it annihilated with itself, interacted, scattered, got produced. A lot of things happened in the 13 billion years. And now we are left with a quarter of the universe as dark matter. Okay, then you ask the simple question in the back of the envelope calculation. If you, you can actually predict the interaction properties of an object. It's like chemical process, interaction properties. You ask what interaction rate would give me the abundance I have today if it ever were in thermal equilibrium. And it gives you a massive weakly interacting particle. If you look up at the particle data book, there's no such particle. A 
like I said, clearly tells you there must be physics beyond standard model or something different. We just don't know. But there's a viable candidate. It's called a massive physically important kind of thing. Okay, so it makes sense to look for it. There's a lot of in the, in, the, in the world, there are a lot of different experiments with billions of dollars being spent to find out what this physics beyond standard model might be. And a key component of that is what is the dark matter of the universe? It's a big question. Okay, And we don't know whether it's related to dark energy or not, but at least try to find out what dark matter is. There are experiments in the space and on the ground looking at if there is dark matter, it can actually annihilate and produce very high energy particles, like neutrinos, uh, positrons, electrons, gammas. So these experiments are designed to look for annihilation. Production in the Large Hadron Collider, it's, it's a very high energy machine where it collides to high energy particles. Then with the energy, it can produce energy, and you look for it. In direct detection experiments like Super CDMS and LUX, the beam is always on. Okay, the particles always exist. They're going through us, and we just have to make the right detector to detect. Okay, so that's that's sort of the scenario for dark matter detection. In the Large Hadron Collider, you collide to a high energy particle. It can produce a lot of things, E equals MC squared. Some of them will probably be dark matter particles. Okay, and then you use this gigantic billion dollar, uh, it, uh, you know, detectors. For reference, that, that's the Atlas detector. That's a person standing there. It's just gigantic. This detector. And then you look for this missing energy. Dark matter disappears, we don't detect it. Okay, that's an evidence. What we do is much more simple. It's like, it's, it's no different from billiard ball, playing billiard ball, okay, <laughs> with uh, billiard ball. So the beam is always on, meaning we're in this dark matter halo, and we're, the sun is moving around the center of the galaxy. So you, you're driving through a rain of dark matter. And every fine morning, something will hit your detector. If you have the right detector, you will see it, okay? Now, how abundant is this dark matter? It's very, very abundant. If I just pick up a bottle, at any point of time, there will be a few particles. Of course, they're, they're not stuck there. They're weakly interacting. They're just flowing through us, okay? Now, if you take the dark matter particle and think about how much energy is it going to can I detect it? Most, if think of this as the dark matter is essentially static. It's not moving, except the sun is moving. So the dominant velocity for this recoil is the sun's velocity, like 200 kilometers per second. If you use that number and pick a heavy wind, like 100 G, the typical massive particle, and collide with a nucleus, the slow-moving particle, it can't resolve the individual nucleons inside your, the, inside your nucleus. So it sees the whole thing. There's a coherent scattering, which boosts the rate. And it gives, leaves an energy that's a few keV. This is a heavy wind. It leaves a few keV. There are a lot of detectors that can detect that so, because it's much more energetic than visible light, which is what we detect. Okay, um, so it's easy. So a lot of experiments do it. Now that's not the only reason. It's a big physics trying to do a, uh, uh, you know answer a big question. So a lot of experiments. This is just an old map. There are many many experiments that, that exist on this map. So how would you make a detection? Uh, make a detector. A simple detector. Could be an ionization detector where you get particles coming in, creates electron hole pairs from the recoil energy deposited in the uh, crystal. Then you apply a small bias, you can get your signal. That's how it's usually done. If you do a back to the envelope calculation of weakly interacting particles and take the detector mass, you can get an estimate of rate. It's extremely small. It's very hard to detect them because of the weak interaction processing. Extremely small. And you're dominated by uh, background particles that are like million, billion times more. The rate is billion times more, okay? Because if you take anything, like a beer, if you're drinking beer and you have our detector next to you, uh, it's going to see a large number of things you know, from the capacitor in the beer. Okay, or if you eat a banana. So the strategy for all dark matter particles, the things that I tell you about dark matter experiments that applies pretty much uniformly to all dark matter experiments when it comes to shielding and the ideas behind searching. Okay, so you basically shield your detector using various te techniques so that you have a quiet space and you can look for the dark matter. WIMP, the dark matter, it doesn't even see the field, right? Because it can go through everything. 
So eventually, it's probabilistic. It will find a recession every once in a while. And it, you can't stop it. So you stop the radiation in the background and wait for the winds to hit you like that. OK, so here's the, the challenge. As I told you, it's a needle in a haystack right now, tiny signal in a giant background. And as de detector guys and analysis uh, uh, you know, work, what we do is convert that, reduce all the background, and make the signal be a buffer background. That's really the key, to reduce your background as much as you can, design the detector so you can reject too many background so you can make it stronger. OK, so the easiest way to reduce that background, majority of the background are really from neutrons. Because muons, as we are flooded by muons, lots of muons. They will uh, do hadronic interactions uh, and knock many things out. Some of them could be neutrons that come and collide with the detector. And those neutrons look like dark matter particles. So easy way out, most of the dark matter experiments are deep underground. The deeper you go, the better you go. That's how the muon flux goes down. Our experiment now is in Sudan, and it's going to be much deeper in our next uh, generation experiment that we start building uh, starting next year. So most of the muons, the minimum ionizing muons, will stop, and they don't make it. But you can't reject all of them because it's not that deep. So you have to come up with ways to detect, tell when those muons are there, or the hydronic showers are there, or something else. So what we do is we use plastic simulators, very old technology, 100 years old, or not 100, but almost, uh, with PMTs. So anything happens, goes to that, it detects. And that's what it looks like for a fluorescent retreated person. And then inside that, what you have is polyethylene and lead. They are for two specific reasons. Our dominant background for neutrons and, uh, and gamma. Okay, So poly is good at moderating neutrons, and gamma is good at Sorry, the lead is good at moderating that. Okay. So with all those layers of shielding, you have a very quiet space in which your detector lives, and you're searching for dark matter. That's the idea. You take any experiment, more or less that's the plan. You have a quiet environment inside school. OK, so now I told you there are many, many experiments in the world. They don't all use the same technology. Once you get the particle recoil, the wind recoil lives a certain amount of energy. Then it depends on what your detector is made of, right? So there are different ways to detect that. Ionization or phonons. Phonon is the vibration in the crystal or light, simulation light. So different experiments use different techniques. The way to look at this is, let's say CDMS, it measures ionization and phonon. That really is, the, is, a, is an essence of the detector technology because it tells apart the background, the electronic recoil from the nuclear recoil very, very well. Many, many signals are there. Very nice separation between background and signal. That's the key of uh, the CDMS technology. OK, how do we know this? We don't have winds. How do we characterize winds? Neutrons are what we use for characterizing winds. They act like winds. And the electron recoil are from gamma. So that's how I detect all this. Right. Now, the detectors, not all detectors are the same. Because of the way they measure the signal, the sensitivity, the quantum of energy, that's produced in that detector is different. In ionization, it's the band gap. Think about the band gap. It's EV. Phonons, it's milli electron volts. It's going to be very small. Light, once you put in all efficiency, it could be a KEV. So that tells you if you have a recoil, if you're searching for low mass winds with a KEV recoil, the difference in statistics is humongous. In light detector, you could have barely see a quantum, whereas in phonons, you could have a million signals. OK, so our detector technology is designed for low threshold, the phonon technology. That's what it is. That's what our collaboration is, Super CDMS. CDMS stands for Cryogenic Dark Matter Search. And these days, it's very fancy to say super, super collider, super CDMS, super stuff, right? So that's what our super collaboration looks like. There was a collaboration meeting earlier this year in the Nickel Institute. The collaboration started when uh, it's a, it's a it's a, it's a, it was a beautiful starting, beginning. It was particle physics meeting condensed matter physicists. Ross Cabrera at, at Stanford, he was a condensed matter physicist. Bernard Sadler at Berkeley, uh, he is the guy who actually instrumental in, in the discovery of W and V dosing. Okay, and so they started this collaboration along with Santa Barbara. The idea, the original motivation 
was we take this low threshold detectors uh, with low background and look for coherent scattering of solar neutrinos. That was the main idea. So it's not a full circle in about 30 years, and we are trying to do that as well, in addition to search and treatment. The way it works, you look for ionization and phony. So these detectors are cooled to cryogenic temperature using dilution distribution. 40 millikelvin, that's what we, we cool down the detector. It, it doesn't have to be 40, it's some tens of millikelvin. The lower, the better. You freeze out the impurities, thermal vibrations are gone, and you have very nice and quiet setup when you measure ionization and phony. How does it work? Particle recoil, electron hole, and phonons from the crystal vibration. High energy phonons, uh, they very quickly down convert like Rayleigh scattering, and then you get low energy phonons very, very quickly. But they, they do bounce around many, many times. So this is the ionization signal, very quick phonon signal to take many, many microseconds to uh, develop. So those are the two channels, the two primary signals. More number of channels you put in, more signals you get, but it's very expensive to get more number of channels. So to get, tell you how many channels we could, in principle, have, or how many sensors there are, there were more than 4,000 sensors on the detector. If any of you wants to see a detector, please stop by after the colloquium, we'll show you one. And if you zoom in, this is a unit of sensor. It's like an aluminum fin that's superconducting. Phonons come and break the Cooper pair in the aluminum fin, and those Cooper pair, or the quasi-particles, are dumped into a transitional sensor made of tungsten that's here, that's much thinner than your hair, and it's this very low mass or very low heat capacity. That's that's why the, the quasi-particle trapping in there, it basically makes the temperature go up very slightly. And the slight change in temperature changes its resistance, and you measure the change in resistance using the change in current using steel. Very sensitive measurement for phonons. That's why it's extremely low threshold measurement. And what it gives us using you know, radioactive sources, excellent energy heat, energy measurements, position measurements using these polymeric sources. It works beautifully. That's how a position reconstruction is. And so analysis is a large part of this. So they, our last results, we haven't, nobody has seen ones yet. Okay. Uh, there's a new analysis going on. Dave Kovacs group is working on that. Dave, his postdoc, John. Oh, hey, I haven't put there two other students. I didn't put their name. I don't even know their under analysis or not. But so that's one branch that's very active. And you might, uh, Kobach could give a colloquium soon <laughs> with the results. All right, so nobody has discovered the answer. I will take a moment to describe this plot uh, for, for a little bit. Not all of you might have seen this plot. What it shows you is a cross section, weak link cross section. This is very small, as you see. That's weakly interacting matrix action, extremely small weak interaction cross section. And on the x axis is the linked matrix. When you see lines like this, that means they're exclusion plots. It means we are 90% confident that the weak cross section for a given mass could not have been higher than that. So it's called an exclusion plot. When you see contours, that means we detected sufficient number of signal above uh, background. and Usually what it turns out is there are many experiments that did those sections. As you do it, dig further or probe further, it turns out there could be due to background or systematic effects that we haven't uh, uh, found out yet. So that's what a limit plot. I'm going to use this again and again, a limit plot looks like. And you'll notice that they, they really become much worse. If they go up, it means it's worse, right? Because you're not sensitive. You can't exclude any cross-section that's lower than that. And they all dive up very, very quickly. All right, so we haven't discovered any wins. What next? What should we do? So at the end of the day, as experimentalists, we measure rates, right? I can tell you I measure 10 events, uh, uh, you know, after all the selection criteria, or 20. Uh, we can't do anything with the flux, unfortunately, or the cross section, right? That's the other guy who did it. So I, we're going to change the, uh, 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 the number of nucleons that we can put in, meaning making bigger detectors better detectors with more efficiency, and a cheaper cost. You can't get a billion dollars. If we scale simply uh, from our past ex experiments, CDMS experiments, CDMS2, and say that we want to explore the full supersymmetric space, and the estimate would be about a billion dollars. Nobody's going to get that, right? So you have to reduce your cost. 
And the process is standard semiconductor industry process. You go through a bunch of steps, you deposit aluminum, uh, I mean, you deposit metals, put a photosensitive coating, and then put the circuit that you want, like this, okay? And then you expose it in UV light, and then you etch it away, and you have a detector. Very standard semiconductor stuff. So that's where the electrical engineering, like Rusty Harris's contribution, and Mark Platt's uh, their contribution was tremendous because we really got it under control in a very short time, much shorter than what it takes Samsung to do. Okay, the way it's done, uh, I'm not gonna show you all the instruments, but the main one, that's a deposition system. That's about a million dollar instrument. What you do is, it can make eight detectors at the same time. You deposit metals in that. I look at uh, how it's done. It's a load lock, it has certain, uh, uh, you know, the, like, you know, places where you can put detector. It takes it to a robotic arm, to a deposition chamber to put various metals. And we have actually made detectors from bare crystals within a day. That's incredible, whereas it used to take a long time. Okay, then you take that metal deposited crystal, you expose it to a circuit that you want, and then you etch it away. If you notice carefully, you'll see the detector taking shape. You can already see the structure. Yeah? There you go. So that's how you make it. You wet edge it just like photographic film. Pretty standard techniques, but you have to use the state of the art technique if you want the yield to be good. So we did that in a few years, in four years. We went from scratch. I still remember the day Mark Flatt joined me in 2009. Uh, we started from scratch. And then in four years, then with Harris, uh, we took the technology from the Stanford detector, like PHPC variation, to essentially no PC variation, very little PC variation. Look at this transition as sensors, right? all the sensors. If you have different PCs, and if you bias it, at a certain point for the best sensitivity, if you have other sensors at different point, they could have very little sensitivity, okay? But not only that, we had the way it works. So these are the aluminum fins. If you look at a cross-section view, phonons break the Cooper pairs in the aluminum uh, superconductor. Then the tungsten transitional sensor collects the quasi particles. It has to go up and go down like that. There's hardly any connection in the Stanford sample. We made it much better. These are SEM scanning electron microscopy images, very good scanning. So we did all that, and this, this work took a few years. These are the key people who did this work. Rusty, Mark, Kunj, who got his PhD in 2013. Andrew, he's gonna defend this month. I was brave enough to put a date. I didn't put a specific month. He's graduating this year. This month, if I'm not wrong. All right, so the cost and quality. Let, him, let, let me remind you, the cost and quality is very important. If you want to take leadership, if you want to propose a big experiment, you can't have expensive detectors like this. So we brought down the cost almost by an order of magnitude, and the yield has improved tremendously. In fact, it's so good, uh, in industry, it's called the golden wafers or reference wafers. You can make uh, wafers like that, and they're used as to tell people, like, that's what you have to do. So our crystals are done like that. You can have a few little errors when you wire bond, we might be able to see some wire bonds here uh, to fix defects, but mostly in this week's experiment. We published this uh, in 2014. We also have the equipment to make bigger detectors. The cost of the project, if you take a three inch detector versus a six inch detector, it's already four times bigger. The cost doesn't scale with uh, mass. It scales with number of detectors. For the same cost, you can have four times more detectors. We're the first one to have a six inch capability we can make bigger detectors. We've done all three inch, four inch, that's for Snow Lab uh, that we're working on now, this is for future. So we have the technology in hand to propose uh, the next generation, next to next generation experiment. But as Tariki told you, it's, it's good news that our experiment did get approval. There are only two experiments that the US funding agencies approved. One is Super City MS, one is LZ. To go and search for wind. That's the state of the art, current generation technology. Nobody has seen anything, and there's a vast area to explore for the next generation experiment. This is called the neutrino floor. The solar neutrino, the atmospheric neutrinos. Neutrinos, they're weakly interacting, and you can't discriminate them. They will act like wind. Eventually, if you hit that, the only saving grace is the flux is low. There are not many neutrinos that are gonna hit you with a 
but eventually if the wind processing is very small, you may have to probe the level that, that where you are stuck by this irreducible neutrino dust. That's why we need more solar. Luis Figari, he's, he's an expert in this. He was the first one in the community to tell people that it's, it's actually a problem. There's an eventual uh, limit. And although there's disagreement on what we call, I don't like the uh, name floor, but that's the bottom, okay? So that's what we are. Uh, the community, the funding agencies, and the community wants us to probe the low threshold uh, direction because of our natural phonon detectors being low mass can allow you to have low threshold. Whereas the LUC, the xenon experiment, they're limited by high mass. So there's a clear division below 10 GeV, above 10 GeV. Two experiments, DOE is not, you know, they're hedging their bets. Of course, if one experiment sees it, what happens? How do you confirm that? It's debatable. So we'll, we'll you know, let's not get there. You know, limited funding can allow that. Okay, so I'll take this moment to tell you there are only two projects I've told you about Super CGMS, but what about the xenon technology? And Bob Webb works on that technology. The idea is you have liquid xenon, and if you get a wimp recoil, there's a there's a light scintillation scintillation light that you detect with CMPs, but they're also electrons, just like CDMS detectors. You apply a bias voltage, high bias voltage, you drift them, and eventually they get to a gaseous phase where there's strong amplification, and it produces secondary emission. The idea is the same. These are background from electron recoil signal from nuclear recoil, okay? It's because of the same reason. The nuclear recoil does not produce good ionization. That's the problem. WIMPs and neutrinos, they do not ionize very well. Now, this, you know, we really miss James. He was one of the best experimentalists. His lab was right next to my lab. His technology contributions are instrumental in the current success of the uh, LUC LG probes. Take a moment to remember him. Okay, so we have the two scenarios uh, where low mass and high mass. The problem here is, let me show you what, how challenging this is. If you look at the low mass, all the sensitivities die up. It's a very hard problem. It's a very hard area to work with. Whereas here, it's, it's much more tolerable. Okay, the reason it does is because of pressure. Let me show you a cartoon. Take 100 GeV wind going with the speed of the sun because you're plowing through it. Take different target materials. And you'll see that that's what the differential rate looks like. It's a function of, is the number of events is a function of recoil energy. But, you know, there are a lot of events at high energy. Make that a lighter wind, 20 GeV. It's very sharply decreasing. There's nothing above 30. Take a 10 GeV wind. There's no signal above 10 keV. To give you a context, CDMS 2, when we, up until five, six years ago, the threshold was 10 keV. We would have never seen anything with that threshold. So you need to lower the threshold so you can actually integrate in this differential effect. So that's the challenge. You need to lower the threshold at that particular point. And not only that, the background, it doesn't matter if you lower the threshold. If your background is large, you have nothing to integrate. So you have to lower the background. So it's, it's a very challenging game or uh, uh, area of research to keep the background low, keep the threshold low, so you can see this. Okay, so that's where the, the high voltage detectors come in, where the idea is that, you know, if you, the phonons that you see, there are some phonons from the crystal vibration. Then there are also electron holes. If you apply a voltage, they drift. And if you, if you, if you apply more and more voltage, they, they will drift even faster, okay? And the electron, they're, they're, they're strongly coupled to phonons, so as you apply more and more voltage, you'll get more and more what are called loop phonons. So that's a great way. Uh, let me pause a little bit to explain it to you in more detail. Problem with WIMPs or neutrinos, they are nuclear recoil. They, they hit your nucleus. The nucleus is tightly bound. It doesn't ionize well, right? Because think about uh, an electron. If you hit it with 10 kg of energy, or the photon or the WIMP, you'll be relativistic. It will bounce around in your, in your detector, and it ionizes very well. Whereas nuclear recoil, it doesn't ionize very well. So it is, that's what we want to amplify, the ionization signal. We give up on the primary phonons, amplify it tremendously so that we can get very good sensitivity. We can actually see 10 keV, 1 keV line with the CDMS, what we call CDMS light signal. And it does give you a beautiful threshold that's much better than any other technology. But the idea is, you know, you get greedy once you 
see there is a possible path for improvement. If you increase this bias, you can indefinitely increase your sensitivity. You can lower your threshold, you can improve your resolution. But in practice, you, you start seeing leakage points as you apply more than uh, uh, you know, 20 volts or so per channel. And the way to fix that, so Nader has been thinking about this problem for 10 years. He said, okay, it, it can't be the bulk of the crystal that breaks down. It has to be probably the context. He said, let's forget about the context. Let's put a context theory here. And he demonstrated with the idea. We made the detector, and it was his idea. He demonstrated the world best resolution for large mass detectors. And it will boggle your mind to see the resolution is 8 EV, better than 8 EV. And we, we, can, we believe we can go around this like a few EV for a single electron uh, sensitivity. If you look at this, if you increase the bias, the phonon noise doesn't change or the signal changes. That's the perfect domain to live in. You increase your bias, you get more and more signal out, you can probe lower and lower threshold properties. It's been submitted a applied physics letter. They, all these detectors now, the good news is they can be, they used to be sent to Berkeley. We brought Berkeley here. So now we have the fridge that works, Glenn's fridge. It's a giant fridge, it's a 400 microwatt fridge. So for uh, reference, the entire Sudan experiment runs with that cooling fridge, the 400 microwatt. Okay, it goes down to very low base temperature, provides infinite number of opportunities for us. That's the low temperature group. And that should actually get accepted for the team. The device group led by Rusty Harris, Mikhail, Mark, Charles, and William. They have done a lot of work on the context because eventually we don't want the context free. We do want some context. And what kind of context would let you uh, apply high voltage? That's a strong area of research. Uh, they're exploring amorphous materials uh, that could let you apply very high bias voltage. So that's, that's very, very exciting. Now, okay, it's one thing to have low sensitivity quite another thing to believe it, right? So if I tell you I have 5 EV threshold, then you say, okay, that's fine. You can show it to me, but then how do you know what the nuclear recoil is going to be? The problem with nuclear recoil is it's going to deposit small amounts of energy. How small? We don't actually know. Okay, uh, down to a certain amount of energy, like a keV or a few keV, we do know how many. But for very low threshold, there is no measurement. And that's where uh, uh, Andrew is going to graduate this year. He's done a remarkable set of uh, experiments at the Nuclear Science Center where there's a pelotron that provides a beam of neutrons, monoenergetic neutrons. The idea is you accelerate a proton, then hit it on a target, and then that produces monoenergetic neutrons. That's your detector. You scatter. The neutron scatters, and you tag it. The kinematics gives you a measure of the independent energy, the recoil energy. And your detector tells you how much energy is going to so you're getting beautiful results. As you see, this is a mess, a lot of uncertainty. The hope is clear it out in our region of interest and make the most precise measurements that we can. And uh, this gives us confidence that what we measure is actually believable. Because if we don't do that, when we show sensitivity plots, they could be off by an order of magnitude or many orders of magnitude. A slight change in the energy scale will change the field dramatically. Okay, now we have this beautiful detectors, beautiful technology, beautiful expertise in place. What physics are we going to do? Of course, we search for WIMP. That's the first thing we're going to do. Super CDMS Snow Lab, that's the Generation 2 project that's approved. That's what our sensitivity is going to look like. So this is what the world's best what is at this point. And this is a look at the order of magnitude improvement. And it's purely because of threshold. You're sensitive to lower energy recoil. Okay? Now, we are going to go, what I'm most excited about in the Celsius region is Sudan, where the CDMS experiment currently is, and the future of snow lab. It's actually a warmer place. It's in Canada, but it's actually warmer. Okay. <laughs> it's deeper, less nuanced, but uh, more importantly, it's better. And the same set of, you know, I, I could skip this slide, various layers of poly and lead, standard technique that all experiments use to protect against background and have a very tight place in the middle. The, the, the beauty of this experiment is it has a large cryostat. Initially, we start with a small payload. But then it allows us to make new improvements, new detectors that will let us search for many different physics processes. And there are four different experiments that we are going to run in there. One is called the standard detection technique. 
So ion addition phonon detectors, then the high voltage detector that I told you about. It may be the first experiment to hit the neutrino flow. Uh, as I showed you uh, in an earlier plot, okay, again, that's the boron eight signal from uh, sun. Okay, so we expect with five years of running, we'll hit that. Okay. Now, one thing, one other thing is, if you think about the particle physics of uh, WIMPs. No one really knows how they interact. We, we know they're weakly interacting, but there are many, many details. Do they have axial vector uh, tensor? What kind of interactions they have? In fact, depending on what kind of interaction they have, it's very popular these days, effective field theory approach. The sensitivities will be very different. You, when you say that I've excluded this cross-section space, you may be totally wrong because you didn't consider the different wind interactions like that. And what that tells us is if you have the ability to change because the, the Main difference in super CDMS and a, a giant monolithic detector like the Lux is the ability to re-modulate. Tomorrow, if I have a great idea, I can put in a different detector. Whereas with Lux, you build it once, and that stays for 10 years. So for us, each month, we're going to have a different technology, so to speak. Okay? So then you can change. You can adapt depending on how the field goes. Is it a different unpaired spin that you need in your detector, or is it low threshold, high threshold, or if xenon sees a signal, what are you going to do? How do you change your detector? Okay, so that's the idea. What else can we do with these beautiful detectors? So what we have done, we started. This is the longest physics process I've ever been involved in for a single analysis. This searching for lightly ionizing particles. Okay, we started the analysis in 2005. The idea is, there. How about fractional charged particles? Yes, quarks. They are rare. Everybody knows, but they are not free. How about freely free? Fractional charge particles. It's nothing. It's not explicitly forbidden. It may be allowed. In fact, the string theory would uh, uh, it predicts that there could be fractional charge particles. I'm not going to go into detail. The idea is, if it does exist, think of a muon going through a stack of six detectors, medium ionizing particles, so it leaves them a lot of energy. But the problem is, if it's fractionally charged, let's say one tenth of an electron charge, then you have to square it to get the energy. So it's square. It quickly drives your threshold. And many people in colliders and uh, non-collider experiments have searched for that, and they have been limited down to one over six electron charge. Because of our low threshold detector and unique technique of making sure, rejecting background using re requiring all hits in all detectors and a straight line we, to reject all background and produce the best limit in the world that goes all the way down to one over 300. And I've published in physical review letters. With our new low threshold detector, it's even more amazing what you can do. That's the PDF of energy deposition. And most of the energy lies above our threshold, the low threshold detector. So compared to what we had, uh, like uh, even thicker to 1,000 of electric charge, we have 14 orders to magnitude improvement. OK, now this is the final stretch of my talk. I'll tell you how we can utilize this detector low threshold detector for a new experiment. We have named it MINER, Mitchell Institute Neutrino Experiment at the reactor. This is a reactor on campus, okay, and that's uh, that's the core. What you're going to see is a, is a, is a pulsing. Uh, we don't need pulsing, but it's really cool. And if you've never seen a reactor, please go see it. It's amazing. That's the strength of light radiation that you're seeing. So the idea is that you, reactors naturally produce neutrinos and tiny neutrinos. So a lot of neutrino experiments, they are placed near reactors. Okay? So the idea is we're going to bring this neutrino, make it hit elastically on our detector, and search for it. The beauty is a lot of flux because you're, you're staying close to the reactor. These are the people that have come up with this plan, uh, uh, a number of experimentalists and three theorists. When we, we've been thinking about this for the last two years. And only in the last two months, the theorists helped us understand what amazing physics potential this experiment could have. It's really mind-blowing. This tells you it's very hard to be alone and doing work alone. It's, you basically need a lot of people, a lot of different expertise if you want to have amazing discovery potential. So let me tell you uh, quickly the process that we're looking at. It's a neutral current process. The neutrino comes in through G0 boson. It, it uh, scatters off your nucleus. Okay? 
reactors produce MeV, MeV, MeV is still neutrino. And at that energy, the neutrino is not going to resolve to a nuclear. So it coherently scatters, just like the wind. It's exactly like wind scattering. Weak cross-section, coherent scattering, and it produces a cross-section in, in standard model. That's much higher than what we've already excluded so far. Why hasn't anybody detected it? If you look at this plot, that's a recoil energy in electron volts and the number of events. There is no signal about it. Really. There is not a single uh, technology in the world, except for us, that exists that can actually probe below it. That's we were the first one that has the technology to make this a possibility. How do people detect neutrinos? They don't use coherent neutron scattering. The coherence, of course, gives you a boost of four orders of magnitude, but typically they are giant detectors like Super K or Ice Cube or 50 kiloton detectors. They look for just inverse beta decay. Okay, so it's easy, it's not hard, you just make gigantic ones. But the beauty is with coherent neutrino scattering that our one kilogram deep detector close to a reactor becomes a multi kiloton detector. That's just mind boggling. A kilogram effectively gives you the same physics reach as a multi kiloton detector. Okay, and there are two factors going into it one is your enhancement due to coherence per square. And because we, we can put the detector right next to a core, it is, just to give, just to do a quick calculation, it basically the flux, neutrino is isotropic, it goes away isotropically, so R squared. So if you have a gigawatt reactor, typical gigawatt power reactor, if you're 30 meters away, the same as a meter away from a megawatt reactor. That's where we can actually do this experiment on campus. Um, running out of time, and let me go through quickly and tell you what the plan is. That's the reactor building. Uh, there's, you should really, I mean, if you're interested, you should uh, sign up and make it, take a tour. Here, the, the reactor, the beauty is the core can be moved in the pool. That gives us excellent sensitivity to very short baseline oscillations of neutrinos, like to sterile neutrinos, for example. Okay, that's possible like the hot steel or a neutrino. The, this is the experimental cavity that we're going to put our detector in, and the core can be dropped very close to that. This is the cross-sectional view. That's the core, that's the fridge, that's the cold stem, ice box with our detector, just like the sedan detectors. The tower detectors would be inside. There's poly and lead shielding because there are a lot of neutrons and gamma coming out of the core. It's a gigantic source of uh, background, neutrons and gamma. So you, you'd say that you must be crazy thinking about doing an experiment next to the core. It's actually easy to block those neutrons and gammas. Uh, most, most of the job is done by the reactor itself, the water and the graphite. And to show you, that's a huge flux. Flux, with, uh, this is spectrum. It's a huge flux coming out of the reactor. Mostly gone after water and graphite. And once you put poly and lead, it goes down. And in the detector, you have this 10 to the 13 reflection going down to this one. That's for neutron, that's for gammas. So rate is expected rate is 40 per detector per day for a process that nobody in the world has seen. We expect about 10,000 events per month. In one month, we can make the coherent neutrino scattering measurement for the first time in the world. But that's not an end in itself. That's predicted by standard model. Okay? Nobody has done it. We'll do it. But it becomes like Higgs. Of course, not like Higgs. But it's not as exciting as Higgs. But you measure process. Why is it important? I'll tell you in a slide. Even if we don't find any physics, it's still very, very important for a main mission of dark matter physics. And I'll tell you in a little bit why. Now, this is a busy plot. I just want to draw your attention to the different sensitivities. There are things that we can do with this measurement, with this precision, statistical, and systematic measurement. We, are, we can be sensitive to, I showed you the Z scattering, Z0. What if there is physics beyond standard model, and there's a Z prime? LHC looks for that. Uh, in fact, we are, we are going to be very competitive with LHC for Z prime. If there's Z prime, there will be additional rate. If there's neutrino magnetic moment, there will be a very sharp change in the rate for low mass, uh, uh, low energy scattering. So all these things become probes, precision probes for physics beyond standard model. I'm not going to go through all of these details, but I'll just show you the summary table with the, with the numbers that you have. The 1 EV threshold, 10 EV. 10 EV is our baseline threshold. But even if we can't, let's say we're off by a factor of 10, even at 100 EV, these are the sensitivities that we, that we see. Our phase one, that we'll 
active in one year with the ten kilogram inspector. For Z prime, it goes as high as 3.4 TeV. That's comparable to LHCV. Okay. For neutrino magnetic moment, it actually becomes the best experiment in the world. So both for Z prime and uh, and neutrino magnetic moment, we would have the best sensitivity in the world within reasonable period of time. And there are a lot of nice cancellations from germanium and silicon. We use two different targets. So this tells us the physics process much better than LHC, because we would actually be able to probe it much more carefully. Now I'll tell you why I'm so excited, even if you don't find physics transformation. Remember, like I said at the beginning, there's a neutrino flow that Lily identified. Okay, that's bothersome. If you think about it, that's our generation two. Is there no life beyond generation two? That should be the question, right? Why would you do a build a dark matter experiment where you know there's a flow? You can't search anything. We just a backup, just a finding magazine. If I knew the floor to 1% accuracy, I could still build a generation two experiment. But I just took trust. That's one of the big motivations. Why we want to make the coherent, this is from the coherent neutrino study. This is what would bother us. So we want to measure this precisely. So we are the ones who can control the generation three. Okay, so back to WIMPs. What else? Are we going to wait for 10 years to search for new physics? Probably not. Because when you have a lot of things uh, under your belt, uh, you get ambitious. Right? So am I going to wait for 10 years? No. Uh, what we could do is take this minor detector, same power, use it in the super CDMS infrastructure in Sudan. The beauty is because of the low threshold, you can reach the neutrino flow very quickly within a few months of running. And so, the, but, but the beauty is it is complementary because we'll be searching for below 1 GeV. Snow Lab is 1 to 10. LZ is 10 to, 100, uh, 10 to 18. Okay, so it's very complementary. It doesn't step in anyone's toes. It's the same technology, same experiment, except we can reach the neutrino flow very, very quickly. Uh, let me pause briefly here. These are all solar neutrinos. There are uh, beryllium-7 from some and the TEP neutrinos. Those are lines, and they give you a huge jump in rate when you expect to hit those lines. And they, so they can be the first direct measurement of solar neutrinos through coherent neutrino study. Our biggest problem here is the background. Like remember, I told you, even if you have great threshold, you're not going to see anything if you have a huge background. So we do have a huge background in Sudan, and we are building detectors that would, uh, that would reject those Compton events. That's our main background. And if we do this experiment, the beauty is this is a plot from Louis, beryllium seven and boron eight. If you measure those you can actually constrain the solar model very, very well. What exactly goes on into the sun? You know, that's not what we had in mind when we began, but that's what we, we can. Because you never really know where the new physics might come out. It took us 100 years to understand 5%. We haven't even fully done it. How long is it going to take to understand 27%, 70%? So we just, just discovered the elephant's tail. What is the new physics? What is it that excites us? It's very exciting because there's a lot of things that are not known. We are probing the supersymmetric space with a new generation experiment. We'll probe it even further. We have now, this is the, uh, the Texas A&M group has an excellent combination because these days the funds are not available for free unlike many years ago. Okay? So you have to be very careful in what you propose and you have to know what you can do. And we have an excellent infrastructure, detector technology, seismic expertise vast experimental expertise to actually do an experiment. For example, one example is the minor experiment that has at least three potential world best measurements that could be done within a year. Okay, so there will be pleasant or unpleasant surprises because we may see a background that we didn't think about. You build this experiment, you know, $50 million experiments, at the end of the day, you might see that there's a background that you didn't think about. So the thing that, uh, keeps us uh, more positive uh, is that our modular detector, we can design the next detector, keeping all the things we learn. We can iterate it properly, okay? And there could be new physics popping up anywhere. And that's what I'm really excited about. Thank you.
this is C A. No, no, no. The neutrino oscillation everybody knows, but what are the actual C and O cycles? That's what we are talking about. We know solar neutrino, neutrinos oscillate. Carbon, nitrogen oscillate. Right, so there's there's an uncertainty there. That's what we are trying to do, not the neutrino oscillation per se. It's not the neutrino. Yeah, so okay, let's let's take this one. Okay, so the weak cross section, they they it's about you know if you look at the textbook like this one, okay, you can look up what weak interaction cross section, is, simple minus thirty nine. Okay, but it it doesn't have to be exactly that. It could be anywhere. In fact, the supersymmetric model that that gives you a model of how this particle could be and how it could interact, the range uh, I haven't shown here, but there might be another plot. The supersymmetric space actually goes all the way to 10 to the minus 37. That large area. And we are just starting to probe that. The new, the generation two experiments will probe most of the supersymmetric space. And the rate or the cross section? Yeah. Right, so the cross section, like I said, you know, it's ball, the ballpark estimate is weak cross section, but there could be large errors. In there. Uh, you just have to do the experiment, search for it. It's not like, let's say, in fact, I, I mean, that's a beautiful question because I remember 10 years or 15 years ago when we would show these plots. Now I've stopped showing the theoretical projections. Theoretical projections were here. As the days went by, more and more uh, uh, were excluded. They keep moving. You see, there there are ways to change your model. There are many ways to change your model. So to answer the cross-section question, there is not a single cross-section. It's it's ballpark weak interaction cross-section. Oh, dark matter density. So dark matter density, if you ask me about dark matter density, let's say it's heavy mass, heavy mass, okay? If it's heavy, then the number density, that's the way you, you get hurt, is by the number density. Plot that shows a graph here. So that's that's a very large mass. Uh, thing, okay. But the reason this this uh, sensitivities you lose is because if the winds are heavy, then the number density goes down because you know the total is 26 percent. That makes it impossible. If they become heavy, you lose the mass. If they're light, you gain the mass. That, that's a, you know the, the, that's a very good question. The only way to find that out is to search for it, they will, uh, right? Because you can't really know if it exists or doesn't exist. But especially, it's hard if you think about our local space. The question is, what is the dark matter in our local space, right? There's, they have the largest error because when you, the astronomers like looking outward, not inward. In fact, the rotation curves are the worst measured for our own galaxy. So it's a very hard question to know. Answer: What do you know about the dark matter content in the local space? The only way to do that is to make a model. It's a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, and the way to think about it is, it's, it's pretty stationary. You know, it's just a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution with very low uh, energy, uh, but the dominant velocity is the sun, I mean, you are driving towards the light. That's the dominant velocity that goes into the calculation. It does, but don't, like, so for example, it's about five to one ratio. So the dark matter is not perfectly stationary, but the dominant velocity that you need to worry about for calculating recoil is the sun's velocity, because you're just moving very fast. Sun is moving much faster than the velocity fluctuations in dark matter. Yes. You mean the astrophysical dark matter, right? 
yeah, so then I mean, when, when you say cosmic, it could mean the sun or the, you know, far away galaxies. So this is, these are solar neutrinos, these are the atmospheric neutrinos. Oh, Big Bang. Okay, so um, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But you know, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they, our experts will stay back. So if you have questions, please, you know, I was representing many, many different people today. Thank you. Thank you.